Herbalism is based on relationship. Relationship between plant and human, plant and planet, human and planet. Using herbs in the healing process means taking part in an ecological cycle. Wendell Berry Welcome back to the Journey to Birth podcast. Today is part one of a series that I will be doing on using herbs in pregnancy. There can be a lot to say about safety when it comes to herbal medicine in general, and even more so in regard to pregnancy. Some people will go and look up information about the herbs that I'll share with you, and they'll read in numerous places that it's contraindicated in pregnancy for one reason or another. And though you do need to use caution, if you only rely on what's published on the internet by experts or what comes from those who have no training in herbal medicine, you'll never have the pleasure of enjoying the benefit of nature's gifts during your pregnancy because every herb you read about will have some negative reference in regard to pregnancy. And this is in part because of the lack of research and in part because of concern over sharing information openly and publicly that might be misunderstood or abused. For instance, when I open a book on botanical medicine for women's health by a well-known alternative medicine expert, the list of herbs contraindicated in pregnancy pretty much rules out herbal medicine at all. But the reason that it's written like that is probably because her publishers and her attorneys required her to do that. Unfortunately, this attempt to overprotect ourselves and what we put out there in the world It makes these books nearly worthless and perpetuates the misinformation about safety and benefits of many herbs in pregnancy. So in short, use this information with caution. Consult with your doctor or prenatal care provider before using any herbs, especially if you have concerns or unique health conditions. And also find a skilled herbalist who understands how to apply herbs in pregnancy if you want further information. And of note... Nothing that you will hear in this podcast has been approved by the FDA and is not intended to prevent, treat, or cure any disease or condition. And now we can get started learning about how herbs fit into pregnancy and birth on the Journey to Birth podcast. Imagine transforming the anxiety, the worry, and uncertainty you have about your birth right now into the confidence and knowledge that will end everyone's questions about your natural birth and even have them asking you how you did it. Are you ready to stop imagining your wonderful birth and start preparing to experience it? Then you're in the right place. I'm Tristan, the creator of the Natural Birth Compass online childbirth education program. And I'm coming to your ears with perspectives of birth from across time and cultures to help you become more informed and confident in your birth. So grab your mug, fill it with your favorite tea, and let's begin the journey to birth. So how can you fit herbs into your pregnancy and eventually into your birth? Herbal medicine can be used as a great source of nourishment for the dense nutrients and vitamin content that is in those herbs. In fact, many herbs are also considered wild foods among some cultures, and these wild food counterparts contain much higher levels of nutrition than the average domesticated agricultural plant foods that we generally eat today. Many herbalists today will say that they use herbs very sparingly in pregnancy and only if really indicated. And while it's prudent to use herbs with caution all the time, especially in pregnancy, there are also nourishing herbs that can add significant improvement to your well-being in your pregnancy, to the health of all of your body's tissues, to the strength of your blood, and even to the health of your mind, all of which can improve your experience in pregnancy and potentially your birth outcome and your postpartum experience. When needed, herbs can also provide support for pregnancy-related discomforts or support for non-pregnancy-related discomforts for which other treatments are not recommended during pregnancy or just undesired in pregnancy. These can range from things like insomnia, digestive upsets like nausea or constipation, poor vessel tone that can lead to things like hemorrhoids or varicosities, Even sometimes cases of bacterial infections like group beta strep, urinary tract infections, or vaginosis, these can be supported with herbs either synergistically along with your prescription medications or as a standalone in some mild cases. Before we get into the herbs themselves, I want to give you some tips on how to source your herbs in case this is all new information to you. So as you're here listening to me talk about herbs, 
What are you picturing right now? Maybe it's a bottle of capsules or pills, maybe a tincture or a tea. Herbs come in many forms. As I mentioned, in some cases, what some people call herbs, other people just call food. Some of the herbs I will discuss will be best taken in tea form, some in tincture form, some you might be able to even find fresh in your own yard or in a nearby wild area. And when you purchase your herbs, I do recommend buying them from a reputable company who works directly with the herbs rather than a larger distributor like Amazon or even a supplement store. This will ensure that you're getting the correct herb. They can also tell you if they've been tested for heavy metals, for pesticides, microbials, and also checked for authenticity. These are not the kind of safeguards that third-party sellers like Amazon can provide for you. So we're almost to the herbs themselves, but I just want to go over a little mini lesson in herbal medicine before we get there. When it comes to herbs, we group them into categories in different ways, depending on the tradition of herbalism you follow. Now, a more modern approach is to categorize them by their chemical compounds and the anticipated physiologic actions or the effect that they're expected to have on the body based on those active constituents. Though this might seem like a clear and scientific way to understand herbs, in my experience and opinion, and the experience and opinions of some very well-researched, well-educated herbalists that I follow, there's a lot of important subtle actions and effects of herbs that only occur after they're ingested that aren't accounted for when herbs are simply categorized by their active constituents. And this is because the interaction that these herbs have in our body once we ingest them is sometimes not exactly as we expect based on lab experiments. So then we have other methods of categorizing herbs that were used by eclectic herbalists, what we might consider the more folk type of herbalists. Their categorizations are based on the actions of the herbs in the body. So an herb is a diaphoretic if it makes you sweat. It's an amemnagogue if it helps regulate your menstrual cycle. It's a galactagogue if it helps increase your milk supply, and so on. Then we have the herbal traditions of different ancient cultures that have persisted through to today, such as Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, Native American herbalism, and so many others. Often, these older traditions categorize herbs by things like their flavor, their temperature, and their strength. And they will almost always use a combination of herbs to create a formulation tailored towards the individual patient. Often, these traditional herbal approaches are actually very sophisticated, involving a long history of experience and a very intimate understanding of the relationship between humans and nature, between plants and animals, insects, water, even air, all of the elements that we rely on on a day-to-day basis. So my official recognized training with herbs is in Chinese herbalism from when I went to school for Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Today I'm going to focus primarily on Western herbs because they're generally more familiar and easy to find and Chinese herbalism is a form of herbal art that I can't do justice to on today's show because it would take hours of me explaining those human to nature relationships before we could even start talking about herbs. Also, I really love Western herbalism because it allows me to share herbs with you that you might be able to find locally. Because part of what brings me so much joy in using plant medicine is being able to connect to the plant through the land that we share with the plants, through seeing it grow, knowing the environment, and having that greater connection with the gifts of plant medicine. So now that you understand a bit about the safety how to source your herbs, and had a little mini lesson about different herbal traditions, we can start learning about some of the herbs that most people can take throughout their pregnancy. So herbs that most women can take in pregnancy without concern are those with very nourishing properties, what we often call tonics. On a chemical and phytonutrient basis, these plants are often very high in minerals, but generally are lower in the compounds that would be considered medicinal. These are highly beneficial in pregnancy because they are often very dense nutritionally. So they can be taken as a food or as an infused tea. So when I say infused tea, I mean taking the fresh or dried plant material and covering it in just boiled water and letting it steep. Generally, that steeping time is going to be a little bit longer than when you're just making a regular bag of 
tea just to have a cup of tea, generally with infusions, you're going to be looking at soaking those herbs for hours versus minutes. To make a basic infusion, you simply take the herb or the combination of herbs that you're using, either dried or fresh, and place them into a heat tolerant jar or a mug or a bowl and let them steep anywhere from 10 minutes to 12 hours, depending on the herbs and the intended use. From there, you just strain them and you are ready to go. And one of the first little formulations I want to introduce to you is a nutritive tonic that you can mix and match and play around with a little bit if you like. And it contains herbs that you'll commonly see in a lot of the commercial pregnancy teas or in different herbalist pregnancy tea formulations. So the first three in that are alfalfa, oat straw, and nettle. And these are known for their rich stores of minerals, including things like potassium, magnesium, calcium, iron. So these are herbs you will generally source dry, and you'll put them into your heat tolerant container. Cover them with about double the amount of water, so your water level will be about twice as high as the level of herbs that you have in the container. And then you want to let it steep for a good long time, about 8 to 12 hours. So what I often have my clients do is make up before bed, and then when they wake up in the morning, their pregnancy tea is ready to go. They just strain the liquid off and sip it as a tea. You can drink it at room temperature, or if you prefer to have it a little bit warmer, you can warm it up on the stove, or you can just add a little bit more just boiled water, and that will warm it right up. Now, just a note on the herbs in this formulation. If you've been prescribed blood thinners by your care provider, or you have any concerns about blood clotting disorders, then you do want to make sure that you speak with your care provider before using nutritive herbs, really in general. Um, but especially with herbs like alfalfa and nettle, because a lot of these herbs contain vitamin K, which increases your platelet's ability to coagulate. Now, because of this, many women who are not on blood thinners or don't have blood clotting concerns will increase their intake of these herbs, especially in the third trimester as they get close to birth. Um, Sometimes it's recommended by their midwives to support their body's ability to moderate their postpartum bleeding. So they still have normal postpartum bleeding, but they decrease their chance of postpartum hemorrhage. But if you have a known clotting disorder, then you're definitely going to want to use caution with these herbs. Often a food grade level of intake is unlikely to overdose you on vitamin K, but just make sure you talk to your care provider and maybe even a skilled herbalist before you incorporate these herbs into your prenatal routine if you have any history of blood clotting disorders or are on blood thinners. Now, another herb that you can add to this mix, if you like, is dandelion leaf. If you're lucky enough to have this herb growing in your own yard or in a nearby local area, and you know that it's clean, meaning it's not sprayed with pesticides or not in a heavily traveled area where it may have a lot of car exhaust on it, um, then you can pick it fresh and infuse it into your tea for lots of mineral content. Um, This herb, the leaves don't generally hold as much nutrient content when you dry them. So I often don't have people add this one if they don't have access to the fresh leaves, depending on the time of year, or if they just don't have it anywhere near them where it's clean. But if you can get the fresh leaves, then it's a great little addition for the boost of mineral content. You can also use fresh dandelion leaves in your salad, or you can mix it with other greens that you saute, or you can add it to soups. Now it is a little bit bitter, so if you're not used to eating more bitter wild greens, then you might want to start off slowly with this one. But dandelion is actually a really amazing plant because it it gets all of these rich bulk nutrients because it sends its roots so deep into the ground, it can actually reach mineral stores in the soil that very few other plants can reach. And that it bring then brings those up through the roots into the leaves and the other parts of the above ground plant. And that's what makes it such a rich nutritive herb and really very undervalued in our landscapes, in my opinion. Now, red raspberry leaf, you've probably heard of. It's an herb that women often ask about as it's, you know, one of the most well-known prenatal herbs and generally recommended for um, helping to promote an efficient labor. So, of course, one of the common questions about that is at what stage in pregnancy is it safe to take red raspberry leaf and could it cause a miscarriage or preterm labor? Well, the chemical constituents in red raspberry leaf, while they do act on the uterus as well as many other smooth tissue, smooth muscle tissues of the body, 
The effect is not one of inducing contractions of the uterine muscle or any other muscle. It actually acts as a tonic to strengthen the uterine muscle, probably in part because it's such a rich source of manganese, a trace mineral, and vitamin C. And these two in combination help to strengthen the collagen protein bonds of connective tissue and smooth muscle. So it will act to strengthen the collagen of the muscles of the uterus in that way. So then when labor is initiated, the uterus has the potential for strong and efficient contractions because it's been so well nourished by these important vitamins and minerals. So that's the long way of saying that you can start taking red raspberry leaf even in the first trimester if you're able to drink it. If don't don't take it in the first trimester if you're drinking it and it's making any nausea worse, then you can wait until the nausea passes and then start bringing that in as a daily tonic, just uh, one cup a day in the second trimester, and then maybe bump that up to two cups a day as you get closer to uh, the time for birth. And another more general nourishing herb that I use just kind of as an all around tonic that I often recommend to my clients to take throughout their pregnancy is goji berries. Now, these little dried red berries, they are rich in amino acids and some minerals, uh, copper, selenium, iron, chromium, and they even have some essential fatty acids, which is rare for plant foods. They are one of the foods that I also find can sometimes help with nausea in pregnancy because of the combination of nutrients and minerals that they have can actually help to balance blood sugars without introducing too much sugar since these berries are relatively low. But do eat them in moderation because, of course, they still will contribute some sugar to your diet. You can eat these dried berries straight. You can add them to a trail mix. You can put them in hot cereals or use them as toppers on your salad. Or you can soak them if you like. Soak them in some nice whole milk yogurt or in some coconut milk overnight, maybe with some chia seeds to make a coconut milk goji chia pudding. Or you can simply make them into a tea. You can just simmer them on the stovetop for about five to 10 minutes, just on low heat with the lid on. Or you can steep them in hot water for a few, a few hours and make an infusion. If you're going to do the infusion method, you'll want to let that go a little bit longer than if you're doing the stovetop simmering method. Now, one note of caution for goji berry reports of allergies to goji berries is extremely low, but do know that it is in the nightshade family. So if you have allergies to other nightshade plants like tomatoes, do make sure you talk to your care provider first. And if you decide to try goji berries, make sure you just introduce them very slowly. Calendula is another one of my all-time favorite pregnancy well, one of my all-time favorite herbs, but definitely one that I recommend a lot in pregnancy because it can be used in so many ways and it's such a nice gentle herb. You can use it topically to support elasticity of your skin. It can be used to make a nice diaper oil or diaper salve that's soothing and antimicrobial for after baby comes. It's also chock full of nutrients when you ingest the herb as well. So you can make it into a tea. You can add it to soups. If you have access to fresh calendula, you can add it as a fun and nutritious edible flower to your salads. So one of the most treasured benefits of calendula, one of the reasons that it's such a useful herb in pregnancy, is its ability to promote collagen formation. So that's why so many women find it such a welcome herb to their pregnancy repertory, because both topically and internally, you can use it to help try to prevent and definitely lessen stretch marks. I have actually have an article about how to make a simple calendula oil that I'll link to in the show notes. So you can order some dried calendula, get a nice high quality oil and make your own topical calendula oil. And then you can also make it into a tea with either dried or fresh calendula to get the same benefits only internally. Calendula is also a nice antimicrobial, so if you need something to apply topically to any little wounds, um, if you have any tearing postpartum, we'll talk about this in a later episode, but um, using that oil or salve can be useful for healing the wounds from that as well. Now, a couple notes on safety of calendula. Now, calendula is also known as pot marigold. Here's where I want you to be careful to not confuse it with the other plant that is known simply as marigold. Marigold and calendula are not the same plant. Marigold 
has toxic compounds and and it's generally not a recommended herbal medicine at all, but especially not in pregnancy. Also note about calendula that it is in the same family as daisy. So if you have a daisy allergy, you will want to consult with your care provider before introducing calendula, either topically or internally. And then if you decide to go ahead and give it a try, do use it in small amounts with caution until you make sure that it's not going to cause any allergies for you. And then I want to leave you with one last little herbal formulation for another common complaint that I hear in early pregnancy. Um, of course, nausea is probably one of the top complaints that I get, um, but one of the other complaints that I hear a lot from my clients in early pregnancy is insomnia or difficulty sleeping, even despite the extreme fatigue that comes with the first trimester. So I have a few herbs that I recommend to help with that, that you can either use them as a standalone, you can mix and match, or you combine all of them into a tea formulation. So the herbs in this formulation include chamomile, linden flower, skullcap, and oat straw. And if you like, you can add a pinch of lavender flowers if you like that flavor. Now this formula is best taken as an infusion from usually dry herbs, and you can make it very simply by using one tablespoon of dry chamomile, one tablespoon of dried linden flowers, two tablespoons of dried skullcap, two tablespoons of dried oat straw, and then that pinch of lavender flowers if you like. Lavender flowers can be a little bit strong, so just take a small pinch, just a few flowers is all you need to add that little bit of flavor. Then you'll want to steep the dried herbs in about three cups of just boiled water, and we're going to make an infusion out of these. So we're going to let them go for about three to four hours, and then you can drink it at room temperature, or if you want to give it a little warm up, you can put it on the stove top or add just a little bit of just boiled water, and then drink about one to two cups in the afternoon or early evening, at least one to two hours before bed. The reason being is that I don't want the extra liquids to counteract the benefit of the herbs because it's waking you up at night to use the restroom more than you already are. Now in this formulation, do note that chamomile is another herb from the daisy family. So if you have an allergy to other flowers in the daisy family, make sure you consult with your care provider and use caution if you decide to try chamomile. If you know that you can't have chamomile, then just simply omit it from this formula and you can make it with the remaining herbs. So now I wanna just do a quick recap because there was a lot of details in this episode. So we started this episode talking about herbal safety, whether or not herbs can be used safely in pregnancy and how they can be brought into your pregnancy. And we also talked about how to source your herbs and working directly with an herbal company rather than going through a third party supplier, just to make sure that you're getting authentic herbs, you're getting clean herbs, and you're getting herbs that are going to help support your health and not take away from it. And we talked about why it is going to be a benefit to bring some nourishing herbs into your pregnancy. Then we covered some of the specific nourishing herbs and tonic herbs, some formulations. We covered a couple of my all-time favorite all-purpose herbs, goji berry and calendula. And then we covered herbs for pregnancy-related sleep disturbance so that hopefully between all of these different areas of herbs, you're getting more nourishment and vitality from the nourishing and tonic herbs. You're getting better sleep with the herbs that help lessen sleep disturbance and promote restful sleep. And then you're getting some extra boost of energy and some support for your skin through the goji berry and calendula. Now in a follow-up episode, I'll cover herbs that support the second half of pregnancy for labor and birth and herbs for the postpartum time. Although that may become a third part in the series if these episodes start to get too long. If you have any specific herbs that you'd like to hear about or have questions about, let me know at info at naturalbirthcompass.com or reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram at Natural Birth Compass. Now, if you love the idea of incorporating herbs and whole food nutrition into your pregnancy, but you need direction and how to do it safely, I would invite you to join our program, the Natural Birth Compass program, where we incorporate these topics into your childbirth preparation, along with a full course in preparing for your birth. Now, in addition to the online courses and downloads that are part of the childbirth preparation course, we also offer monthly virtual calls so that you can have all of your pregnancy, birth, and postpartum questions answered, and also get personalized nutrition and herbal guidance for your pregnancy and your birth. So just go visit naturalbirthcompass.com forward slash course for all of the information on that. And I hope to see you there soon. 
So thanks so much for joining me on this first episode as we talked about one of my great loves using herbs. And until next time, I'm wishing you a wonderful journey to birth. Thank you for listening and being open to new perspectives as we spent this time together. As always, let me know how I can support your journey. If you have topics you want to hear about, guests you'd like to hear from, questions or comments to share, let me know. This podcast is always transforming and you can help shape it into something that helps thousands of families have the best pregnancy, birth, and transition into parenthood possible by leaving a comment or a review or sharing this podcast with others in your life who will benefit from our discussions. Find me on the socials at Natural Birth Compass or email me at info at naturalbirthcompass.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on our next episode. Wishing you a wonderful journey to birth.